Hebrews chapter 3, we're continuing on in this sermon, and I, I encourage you to look at it as a sermon. From the first to the last chapter, the pastor is preaching. He is teaching, and he is formulating a concept, an idea from the very beginning and walking it all the way through, seeking a, a meticulously thought out and spirit-led inspiration. It's a remarkable sermon. And the focus of the first part, the first four chapters really, is the communication of God. God communicating to his people in many portions and many ways through the prophets. We already read that. And in these last days, he has spoken to us in son. And in these four chapters, as, as he opens up this whole concept of Jesus and begins to really explain from truly a Hebrew perspective who Messiah is and how Jesus is that fulfillment, as he does so, part of what begins to emerge in these opening chapters is the necessity of our responding to him. He communicates, we respond. We don't just sit there dully looking at him with glazed over eyes like a teenager who's just been busted. We respond to him. But sometimes that response, man, to answer God would be terrifying. To have to give answer to God, horrifying. Our God is a consuming fire, as the writer will tell us. And there's only one way truly that we can approach God, that we can answer God, and that is through the humanly divine mediation of Jesus Christ. God made it possible not only for us to hear from him, but for us to respond to him through Jesus. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the author and high priest of our confession. Wow. Partakers of a heavenly calling. That sounds good to me. How, how do we do that? How do we partake of a heavenly calling? Well, it's contained in the first verse. You consider Jesus. If you want to partake of this heavenly calling, if you want to experience heavenly things from a heavenly perspective and ultimately eternity itself, it must be through the consideration of Jesus Christ, who is, Hebrews 13, 8, the same. Okay, we're going to get stronger every week. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Consistent, sure, absolute. Now, so far in the sermon, we've heard or seen three designations for the Son. The first, mo first and foremost being Son. It's the first thing that he's called here in the second verse. In these last days, God has spoken to us in Son. And that sonship of Jesus is vital to understand. We've talked about it a lot, that it is, that it is firstborn sonship. That it's the heir apparent, that it, it contains all of the authority and the rights and the privileges of the Father himself, the Son. But here in chapter 3, we find two more designations from the pastor, and they are apostle and high priest. Now, apostle's interesting to me because the apostle, we're told of our confession, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Apostle, this is the only time it's used for Jesus in the entire Bible. Only here. Everywhere else you see the word apostle, it's applied to those who are disciples of his or who are sent by him. But here, the pastor says, no, Jesus is the first apostle, we could say. He's the original apostle. John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said to them on that Sunday night of his resurrection, he said, peace be with you as the father has sent me, so I send you. An apostle is a sent one. And Jackie, I apologize for the junior hires and the noise through the kitchen tonight. You're just going to have to deal with it over there. We'll get a, a window on there. And if it gets too rowdy, well, we'll just threaten Jake within an inch of his job. <laughs> Apostle, a sent one, someone who is sent out. That, that's just the meaning of the word. Now, there are the 12 apostles who are specifically designated, and you know of them. But Jesus is the first one sent, the sent one by God. 
He is where the title originates. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 tells us, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now that word propitiation is high priestly. And it speaks of redemption. It speaks of atonement, but as we've also talked about, more than atonement. Atonement is a temporary covering. Propitiation is a washing and a cleansing that is permanent. And this high priest comes along with a permanent solution to our sin. Now think about those two titles. Apostle and high priest. They're not only interesting because apostle is unique here to Jesus. And high priest speaks of of truly who he is. The apostle means he is God's representative to us. The high priest means he's our representative before God. So apostle and high priest goes both directions. God to man, man to God, and Jesus is both. Jesus bears both positions. The high priest, he bore the positional role between Israel and God. He stood in the gap. He was the mediator. The intercessor, if you will, of the people before God. And the Hebrew writer reminds us of this many times, but applying it to Jesus, the perfect high priest. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. He is the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Hebrews 9, 15. He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And again in Hebrews 12, 24, Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. He's the go-between. Now, we learn very early on in life, we need go-betweens. In junior high... Go ask her if she likes me. You know, every junior high kid needed a go-between to find out if she thought he was cool. Sometimes even high school kids did. I'll never forget asking Lynn Martin if she would be the go-between between me and Cheryl. Go find out if she'll go out with me. And Lynn went, found out, came back. She will, but she doesn't want to be in a relationship. <laughs> Winner, loser. (laughs) Wait a minute. That didn't come out right. (laughs) Moving on, we all need a go-between. We we desire a go-between. And spiritually speaking, what we do in the church is we talk about intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is someone who goes between, who goes before the Lord for us. Someone who will intercede. Oh, would you intercede for me? Please pray for me, we'll say. We even sometimes speak of ourselves as intercessors. Please listen carefully. I am not your go-between to God. Less is not your go-between. He is not your mediator. No pastor can be. No priest, no saint, no martyr, not even an apostle other than Jesus can be the mediator between man and God. I understand we speak of ourselves as intercessors because we do pray for each other. We're called to pray for each other. But we do not bear the necessary weight of the cross. Only Jesus did that. Only Jesus, therefore, has the full right and privilege to stand before the Father and intercede on our behalf. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, Paul said, There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Why? Because he gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony at the proper time. So I guess we shouldn't do intercessory prayer? I didn't say that. What I am saying is that when we intercede for one another, understand we are going to the intercessor. We are just simply taking it to Jesus. He's the one who carries the message. He's the one who prays for us and with us. He's the one who puts the prayers in our heads in the first place. He is the mediator, and we are not. We just go to Him. Hebrews 7.25 tells us he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. 
which makes him the perfect high priest because every other high priest died. No other high priest could continue perpetually forever. Jesus does. Never ending intercession. You always have a voice to the Father and His name is Jesus. Now, it's also rare, considering the Hebrew background of the pastor here, in the Old Testament, rare to combine those roles of apostle and priest. Or envoy and priest. Usually someone was either a prophet or a priest. Sometimes we have both. There are those rare occasions. Moses is probably the best example, and so the pastor turns to him now. In verse 2, He, speaking of Jesus, was faithful to him, God, who appointed him, Jesus, as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. Do you realize what he just said? He just confirmed to us once again that Jesus is God. Moses is only a servant in the house. Jesus is the builder. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And all things were made through Him. He is the Creator, the Sustainer of all life. That's Jesus. Moses was in the house, a servant of the house, but not the builder. Jesus is the builder, and that's the great implication. But stick with Moses for a moment. It tells us he's been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone... But the builder of all things is God, hence Jesus. Now, Moses, verse 5, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. What things were to be spoken later? Later, in these last days, he has spoken to us in son. Moses was simply a representative bringing the word, pointing the direction. You know, I, I recall back when we studied Deuteronomy. Early on in the, in the life of this fellowship, there were certain books that terrified me. Because I knew we had to make our way through them somehow. Genesis was cool, lots of stories. Exodus got a little more difficult with the law, but still lots of stories. And Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus horrified me. How you're going to talk about some of those laws, you know. We got through all of those, okay, numbers, a lot more stories, even among, amongst all the numbering of the people. But Deuteronomy, I thought, this is just going to retell the whole thing. we got to start over and go through it again. And I discovered, as many of you have, that Deuteronomy is one of the most prophecy-packed books in the Bible. Blew my mind. Awesome stuff. And Moses in it, speaking of Jesus, pointing to Jesus, looking to the prophet that God would raise up from among His people. Moses spoke early on of the Son, pointed to the Son, and in the last days God has spoken to us in the Son. But you've got to give Moses creds as a servant of the house. In fact, I would say the servant of the house deserves the proper respect and honor for his faithfulness. Keep your finger there in Hebrews 3 and turn back for a moment to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 12. I just want to give you a little vignette of something that took place and the significance of it related to Moses as the servant of the house. Numbers chapter 12. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Book number 4. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron, you know, Moses' sister and brother, spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. (laughs) You know why God does that? Because we miss it the first time. (laughs) And then he says in verse 2, they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Now I know that never happens in the church. Oh, who do you think you are? You think God only talks to you? Why didn't he ever talk to me? Well, if you'd shut up long enough, maybe he would. (laughs) Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. (laughs) Now, verse 3, and I love this verse. The man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. 
Moses wrote numbers. So Moses wrote, now the man Moses was very humble more than any man who was on the face of the earth. He wrote that. Now, I don't think he wrote it thinking, well, of course I am. I think he probably wrote it under duress. Write it down, Moses, the Lord says. And Moses says, oh, Lord, don't make me write it. Write it down. All right. More humble than anyone else. Okay. <laughs> Suddenly, verse 4, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, you three come out to the tent of meeting. <laughs> this is so parental. I love it. So the three of them came out. And then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called Aaron and Miriam, and when they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. That's where the Hebrew pastor got the idea, by the way. A faithful servant in all God's household. There it is. When I, with him, I speak mouth to mouth, verse 8, God says, even openly and not in dark sayings, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he departed. And when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous. As white as snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam. Behold, she was leprous. And then Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, I beg you. Notice now he's calling him my Lord. I beg you, do not account the sin to us in which we have acted foolishly and in which we have sinned. Oh, do not let her be like one of the dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. Moses cried out to the Lord saying, Oh, God, heal her, I pray. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp, and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until Miriam was received again. Afterward, however, the people moved out from Hatzorot and camped in the wilderness of Paran. And I need to make a correction to you all. I said recently that the law of purification for healing from leprosy was only used once, and that was on Nahum and the Syrian all the way until Jesus came. I have to retract that and say it was used twice. Miriam, after seven days, would have had to have been healed of leprosy to come back into the camp. Therefore, that law had two applications, one to a Gentile and the other to a daughter. Interesting. But the point of all this is simple. You want to make your skin crawl and end up outside the camp in the favor of the Lord? Just speak against a servant of God. He really takes it seriously. We as followers of Jesus Christ need to be a people who don't speak against each other. Rather, we speak to each other. You got a problem with me? Come and tell me, please. I got a problem with you. I need to go to you. And we speak to one another, not against, not about, and not behind one another. Because you happen to sit in a room this evening with a bunch of God's appointed servants. Servants of the Lord. And servants of the house receive a certain degree of honor. But hey, if God required such respect for Moses, simply a servant in the house, how much more for Jesus? Back in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. I'll pick it up in verse 5 while you're flipping back there. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ as a son over the house whose house (laughs) we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Jesus has all the rights, all the privileges, and especially all the authority of the Father. Now, I'm not telling you all anything you don't know. Jesus is the authority. God said, Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. All the authority belongs to Jesus. 
All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, verse 20. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him, John 5, 22 and 23. The honor, the right, the authority belongs to Jesus. Now, if you were here Sunday, you know what makes that absolutely remarkable is that then He turns around and calls us brothers and sisters refers to us as brethren. You see, the the heavenly calling, he mentions back there in verse 1, partakers of a heavenly calling, that heavenly calling, that heavenly eternal invitation goes out from Jesus to all people. To the entire planet, to all people of all history, the invitation goes out. And not to be just house guests. And not to be, as the prodigal asked for, just a servant but to be sons and daughters of God. To, like Jesus, be sons in the house, a holy brethren. Note he called them that also in verse 1. Holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. You become that in Christ. Holy brethren, not only of one another, but of Jesus himself. Because he is not ashamed to call them brethren. His household. But there's a catch. Look right in the middle of verse 6. It's a little word, but it has huge implications. If. Whose household we are if. We hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. If is a conditional word. We're his house. We're his brothers and sisters. We're we're his family. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. If. If. Does that make anybody uncomfortable? We don't like the if words in the Bible. We just prefer to go right on by them into the place of absolute unconditional love. We love to talk about the agape of God. We love grace. We love mercy. If. Listen, in this sermon... More than anywhere else in the New Testament, there is a repeated, consistent insistence on our holding fast to the end. The writer is calling upon the people to hold on, to press in, to go forward, to stay faithful. That is to respond to this great offer of salvation. God speaks, we respond. God has spoken in His Son. We respond to His Son. But our response is vital. Our response is the if factor. Whose household we are if. If we respond to the Father. If we hold fast. That phrase hold fast, it holds on. We see it throughout the New Testament. We see it gaining steam even in the book of Revelation. Revelation 2.25 Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. Revelation 3.11 I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one will take your crown. Revelation 14.12 tells us here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Wait a minute. i got to keep the commandments? How do I do that? Through faith in Jesus. Your faith in Jesus keeps the commandments. You all understand that, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two hangs the entire law and the prophets. You do that and the rest will fall in line. Faith is the absolute key to the commandments. Faith is the key to the perseverance. Perseverance strengthens faith. Faith grows perseverance. It goes together. And perseverance is what he's talking about when he says, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Hold fast our confidence. The word confidence in the Greek means literally freedom of speech. Open, unreserved, unhindered speaking. 
God has spoken to us, our confidence is that we now speak of God. We now declare Jesus. We now confess him. Ask yourself this question. Am I confident enough in Jesus Christ to declare him openly? Because that's our calling. You want to be a son, a daughter of the house? We confess Jesus. Matthew 10, 32. Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But if you do not confess me before men, Jesus says, I will not confess you before my Father who's in heaven. Hold fast the confidence. We have, and this has nothing to do, by the way, with personality. Extroversion, introversion, any other version. It doesn't have to do with that. It doesn't matter what your personality type is. You still, as a follower of Jesus Christ, are called to be one who has confidence. I was just dropping David off at, at Taekwondo tonight. My nine-year-old and... Um, as we're getting out of the car, he, he has to go early on Wednesday nights. He goes to the 5 to 6 class instead of the 6 to 7 class, which is his normal group. And he doesn't like going to the 5 to 6 class because it's a younger group of kids. And that makes him the senior student in the class. And as the senior student in the class, he has to talk. I don't want to talk, Dad. Well, David, it's good for you to talk, son, but I don't want to talk, Dad. And anyone who knows David knows that he doesn't talk. In fact, that conversation I just shared with you took me about 17 minutes just to figure out what he was saying. You know what? David is called to have confident speech in Jesus Christ. He's a quiet boy. But his confidence means he would not be afraid to speak of Jesus. Again, has nothing to do with our personality. We are invited not to be reserved with the gospel. But to be open declarers, bold ambassadors. Man, you can be as quiet as you want about anything else. Your political persuasion, feel free to keep that quiet. I know some of you will wish I would. You know, your, your attitudes about life, your Facebook posts, feel free not to do it. But when it comes to Jesus, I don't think any of us have a choice. We are called to be bold ambassadors. To open our mouths for the sake of our king. How do we do that? It's very simple. By boasting in our hope. Hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope. And that's not foolish pride. In fact, probably a better translation of the word boast there is rejoicing. It's kalkema in the Greek, and it means literally to rejoice, to sing out. The rejoicing of our hope. How do I bear that freedom of speech in Jesus, that, that confidence? I just rejoice in Him. I rejoice in the fact that Jesus is my hope. He is my good news. So we talk about Him, we declare Him, we rejoice in Him, and that, holy brethren, is what it means to be partakers of a heavenly calling and to be of the household of God. Verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, I love it, now instead of saying someone said somewhere, he points out it's the Holy Spirit. He is still not going to give David credit until later, which you'll see. Verse 7. Just as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of the trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works <laughs> for 40 years. Two years of traveling wasn't long enough to see all the works and the miracles and the wonders of God. They needed 40 more to get it. And verse 10, therefore, I was angry with this generation and said they always go astray in their heart as they did not know my way and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And we come to the key word, rest. It's been said what's in the Old Testament concealed is in the New Testament revealed. And here, the Hebrew pastor reveals Psalm 95 in all of its intentions. So please turn back to Psalm 95. Keep your finger there in Hebrews 3. Psalm 95. It doesn't tell us that the writer is David, although the Hebrew pastor tells us a few verses down that the writer is David, so we understand that David wrote Psalm 95. 
And I just want to read through it, and if you're quick enough on the draw, you can flip back and forth and see how closely quoted Psalm 95 is in Hebrews 3, or just, just listen up. Psalm 95, verse 1. Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. Oh, for the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are His also. The sea is His, for it was He who made it, and His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. And here's where the Hebrew pastor picks it up. Today, if you would hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the days of Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people who err in their heart and they do not know my ways. Therefore I swore in my anger they shall not enter into my rest. David is speaking prophetically in Psalm 95. He establishes three things. And this is kind of an outline for Psalm 95. I'll give you quickly. He first talks about the rock of our salvation in the first five verses. The glory of God. Praise to God who is the rock of our salvation. And then in verses 6 and 7, he portrays the restful sheep. We are the sheep of his hand. We're the people of his pasture. He's the rock. We're the sheep. But then finally in the third part of this psalm, verses 8 through 11, he talks about the rebellion that cannot enter rest. The rock of our salvation, the restful sheep, the rebellion that cannot enter rest. And while that was Israel in the wilderness, speaking of them and their behavior, the early Christians saw the life of the Christ follower as a great parallel to the exodus. And that's interesting to note in the New Testament to track through how often the the Gospels and the letters compare our life to the wilderness wanderings of Israel, to the exodus, to the deliverance even of the people. Think about it. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for how long? Forty days in the wilderness. Interesting. Jesus calls himself the bread of heaven. John chapter 6. In that remarkable display, and don't miss this, when he fed the 5,000, when that bread did not give out and 5,000 men ate and were filled, the people recognized, hey, this is the prophet Moses was talking about. No one since Moses has given us bread from heaven. No one has multiplied bread like this. So Jesus comes along and in that miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000, One to a largely Hebrew audience, and interestingly, one to a largely Gentile audience. (coughs) Jesus portrayed himself as the bread of heaven. And then in John 6, he describes himself exactly that way. I'm the bread of heaven. I'm the bread of life. He who eats me will never hunger. He who drinks my blood will never thirst. And you remember, that was hard teaching. Some people left over that one. In John chapter 7... Jesus cried out, I am the living water. He who comes to me will never thirst. Well, what happened in the wilderness? They were thirsty all the time and complaining about it a lot. Water came from the rock. The rock is Christ. The water comes from the rock, the living water of Jesus. The parallels are perfect. Even in his transfiguration, I don't know if I mentioned this when we went through Luke. I may have missed it, but check this out now. Luke chapter 9, verse 30 tells us, Behold, two men were talking with Jesus, and they were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Know what the Greek word for departure is? Exodus. His exodus. Jesus was himself about to go through his own exodus from the earth in the crucifixion, in the burial, and in his resurrection and ascension, the exodus. So we see this throughout 
the New Testament. We see it in the writings of Paul most clearly as he writes in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they all ate the same spiritual food. And they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, most of them, with most of them, God was not well pleased. For they were laid low in the wilderness. Literally to the dust. So we see it throughout the New Testament, this reference to the Exodus, this reference to the deliverance of Israel. It's such a fantastic picture. And the Lord draws off it. Jesus drew off it. The writers draw off it. Back now in Hebrews chapter 3, the pastor draws off of it as well. He gives this psalm, Psalm 95. He walks it through. And by the way, if you're wondering why in Psalm 95 it says that they provoked, that they... You know, you, you came against me at Meribah, and, and it uses the words Meribah and Massa. Well, that's real easy in verse 8. They provoked me. Provoked in the Hebrew is Meribah. Meribah means to cause strife or to provoke, a provocation. And as in the day of trial, to tempt or to try is Masa in the Hebrew. So it's just um, basically the translation of those Hebrew words in verse 8. But now looking at verse 12, the Hebrew pastor begins to explain and use the text of Psalm 95 and give application to it to us right now. Take care, verse 12, my brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. And here it is again. If. Man, like a big sore thumb sticking out in the middle of the wilderness. If we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. The if is why some people don't like this Hebrew sermon. Why some scholars... Some professors, some Christians just avoid Hebrews altogether because there's some uncomfortable language. The word if is used just a little too much. The warning against falling away, and he's talking to people of faith. Don't fall away. Don't fall back. That word, by the way, falling away back there in verse 12 is a fistomai. The same word as, anybody know? It's the same word as departure, to depart, to fall away, apostasia, apostasy. Don't be those who, who are falling or, or with an unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. Man, this if, it sits there. And you know what? I want to be once saved, always saved. That's what I want. I want to shake the hand, sign the document, do the deed and be done and know I'm good to go. Most Christians do. Most people, you start throwing out the word if, and it makes them really uncomfortable. Listen, if you want to be once saved, always saved, great. Believe. Believe. Now listen, so far as it depends on Christ, your salvation is absolutely secure. He's not going to lose it. It's not like you're going to arrive at the gates, and Jesus is going to be going, where did I put that salvation? I know I had it here. So I'm going to have to go back and check my dresser because I had it somewhere. Your name on it. Just, just hang out. I'll be back. I mean, wouldn't that be horrifying? <laughs> Jesus will not lose you. Jesus will not let you go. So far as it depends on you, trust that he won't. Believe it. <clears throat> Take him at his word. Let your confidence be in Jesus and not in yourself. It's remarkable what faith does to a heart. What trusting in Jesus does when it comes to holding fast. You want to hold fast? Have faith. And the more you have faith, the more you'll hold fast. And the more you hold fast, the greater your faith. We are called to respond here. Faith 
We know this, Hebrews 11, 1, we're going to jump ahead to this, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews 11, 6, and without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. Faith is not about keeping lists or legal regulations, although faith does cause you to do those things gladly, joyfully, naturally, because you do them out of faith. And faith shapes life. That works for anything, whether you're a follower of Jesus Christ or of Oprah. (laughs) I only mention her because apparently there's a presidential run in her future. Wow. Can you imagine the American flag with a big O in the middle of it? I'm sorry. I just... <laughs> Faith shapes life. What you believe makes who you are. Rich Mullins nailed it. In his song Creed, he wrote, I believe what I believe is what makes me what I am. I did not make it. No, it is making me. It's the very truth of God and not the invention of any man. Now, he's talking about faith in Jesus, and faith in Jesus shapes your life. So does faith in anything else. Whatever you determine you're going to trust, whatever I think I'm going to sink my faith into, that will shape me. I will begin to look that way. I will act that way. I will think that way. And I've shared this before, and I know it's not popular to say in this current climate or culture. I guess it's becoming more popular. But the Muslim terrorist... The, what what our, our culture calls the radical, the extreme Muslim, is just a Muslim whose faith is shaping his life. He is just doing what the Koran says to do. He is just following through in the pattern of the founder of his religion, Muhammad. And by doing that, he becomes, we say, a radical. No, he's just a solid Muslim. To be honest, faith shapes life. Faith shapes us. Faith in Jesus, there is a uniqueness to it, though, because faith in Jesus not only affects my behavior, it changes my heart in a way nothing else can. But if that's the case, then how does the pastor, why does the pastor introduce doubt into our faith? By saying if. You know, if you hold fast, if you proclaim your confidence, you know, if you are rejoicing in all these things, If, if, if. It's this big blaring thing. Someone says, don't say if, if you want my faith to be okay. Read on. Verse 15. While it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as when they provoked me. For who provoked him? Who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed. Did not all those who came out of Egypt, led by Moses, the whole kit and caboodle of them? Verse 17, I added kit and caboodle, you're not going to find that in your translations. <laughs> Verse 17, and with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And now he defines for us what disobedience really is. Verse 19, so we see they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Faith is the issue. The disobedience was not rooted in not doing the right thing. It was rooted in unbelief. They didn't trust him. They didn't believe in him. And what he's talking about there is Kadesh Varnia. When they were on the very border of the promised land and the 12 spies came back, two of them, Joshua and Mad Dog, right? Joshua and Caleb come back and go, we can take them. They're big, but the bigger they are, you know, and they were ready to go fight. And the other 10 are like, they're so huge. We're like grasshoppers. (laughs) And in that moment, the heart of all Israel failed. And so for 40 years, they turned around and walked. They made it all the way there. What a mess. It was unbelief. And here's the application, verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, let us fear. I I love the Jewish mindset. Because the, the Hebrew thinker, when approaching God, is not afraid to be afraid. 
Christians, oh, we've gotten so casual with God, we don't like to use words like fear. The Hebrew says, no, no, fear's a good thing. And I wholeheartedly agree. Let us fear. If while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. I think we need a little more fear in our faith. Not fear that I'm going to be lost. Not fear that Jesus is going to forget my name. But fear of of the holiness of what we are involved with. Fear of the awesome nature of God. Not fear of paradise lost, but a holy sanctifying fear of the Lord. Remember, one aspect of the Holy Spirit is the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11 verse 2. He's described as the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding of counsel and strength of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That deep, almost life-rattling reverence of who God is. We need a little more fear so that we would not come short of His rest. How can we do that? How does that take place? How does one come up short of His rest? Get this. True rest is not kicking back. True rest is not a hammock and a beer in the Caribbean. True rest is not finally a day off, which I'm not opposed to days off. True rest is not the vacation I longed for. We started ribbing Jake and Cam today at staff meeting because they're going on vacation. And Jeff said in our staff meeting, you know, before your vacation's even begun, it's already over. In true D'Angelo style. It's already over. Jake's like, what? He's like, yeah, because from here on out, every day is a day lost. Every day is one more day of vacation that's over. (laughs) He's right. True rest. True rest. (laughs) Is not kicking back. Kicking back is one sure way to come up short of the rest of God. Let me explain. David knew all about this. He understood the idea of kicking back and coming up short. Of thinking he was going to get some extra rest, but it became an absolute mess. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 tells us it happened in the spring. At the time when the kings go out to battle... That David, I might remind you, King David, sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. That verse is absolutely packed with truth. David should have been out fighting with his people. David should have been out standing in the name of the Lord against the pagan. But David stayed back in the spring to kick off his sandals and relax on his rooftop. And when evening came, David, note this, when evening came, David arose from his bed. What is he doing in bed in the evening? The implication is the kings are out fighting the battles and David's been kicking back in bed all day long. Lazy. This is not typical of David, if you know the story of David's life. He was not a kickback type of guy, but apparently he'd had a rough winter. And so in the evening, he arose from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. And David's faith took a bath. Sheba. <laughs> And it was all because David thought he'd get a little extra rest. I'm telling you, the idea of kicking off your sandals is not what the rest of God is all about. The rest of God is much bigger, much deeper than this. And as a matter of fact, it was when David was on the run from Saul that he ended up in the rocky crags hiding out and he wrote some of the most restful psalms of any of them. When he was besieged, when he was at a time in his life that you would think would be anything but restful, he was up there with his harp and his lyre, plucking and strumming, and the guys are up there. And if you've ever been up into those rocky crags in Israel, it's beautiful up there. It's a restful place. 
But I can't imagine being up there with an army at the base of it trying to take me out. And yet, David's faith was at its strongest when he had to trust in God to deliver him. But when he could send other people out to fight his battles for him and he could just sit back and kick off his shoes, that was when David's faith was weakest. Verse 2 of Hebrews 4, For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word, now going back to the children of Israel in the wilderness, the word they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Oh, they heard it. They saw the miracles and the wonders with their eyes, but it didn't translate to faith. United by faith. This is the key to rest. Faith is the key. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. It's faith, and it lets be sure of the translation and the understanding of the word faith. Faith is trusting God. It is active, confident trust in God. You know He's going to follow through. You know He's going to be there. You know He's going to do what He said He was going to do. And even when you doubt, you trust that He's going to follow through even if you're uncertain yourself. Faith unites what is heard in the ears with the heart. You wonder why sometimes people, maybe it was you, go to church for years and years and they get it up here, but they don't get it in their spirit. It doesn't really change them. It doesn't impact them. Luke and I were talking earlier about a guy who was actually a... Was he a pastor, Luke? He was a pastor. And now he doesn't believe. Because though the, the word got to the head, it never got into the heart. He heard it. But faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith is the, is the mechanism by which the word enters and gets into the heart. The word has to be united by faith. And when the word is united by faith, when we utter that simple trust in him, when faith joins the word of God, suddenly the word becomes seed that takes root in my heart. It, it's, it's the wheat embedded in the good soil. It's what Jeremiah described, Jeremiah 17, verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. He will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green. It will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. Faith does that. By the way, in that same passage, the very next verse of Jeremiah 17 is verse 9, which says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. So trust in the Lord. Faith is what heals the heart of its deceitfully desperate disease. And once healed, causes the heart to be good soil to bear fruit. Faith is your response to his speaking. God speaks we respond. In Son, He speaks. In Son, we have faith. Verse 3, For we who have believed enter that rest. He just underlined that sentence right there. We who have believed enter that rest. He's going to say in a few moments, be diligent to enter that rest. And that could be confusing. i got to work hard for the rest. By faith. We who have believed Enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, watch this. The pastor here gives three examples of rest. He, he's still applying what he talked about in Psalm 95. And the first example of rest that he turns to is creation, the rest of creation. Verse 4. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And again, this passage, they shall not enter my rest, which again is Psalm 95, verse 11. What's he talking about? The rest of creation. 
The first part of Psalm 95 deals with God the Creator. Let's worship Him. Let's praise Him. He's made the sea. He's made the mountain peaks. He's done it all. It's His creative handiwork. But what did God do at the end of the six days of creation? He rested. Why did He rest? Because the work was done. The work was finished. And so He created a law from that. God's law, the original law, Exodus 20, verse 11, or verse 8 through 11, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. The sea and all that's in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. He rested because the work was done. And he introduced Shabbat to the Jewish people, not as a burden, not for more work. He introduced Shabbat as the example of stopping work and of resting. But Israel never seemed to arrive at the Sabbath. They kept it every week and have for thousands of years. You know the old saying, it's not that the Jews kept the Sabbath, it's the Sabbath kept the Jews. And truly that day has been something that has united and held the Jewish people together through the worst of persecution in world history. But they still never, as a people, arrived at that rest. No, instead, the rabbis worked it. And we've talked about this recently. 39 work-related prohibitions on Shabbat. You've got to avoid these things. You've got to work at resting. And some of the avoidances are so, so hard to do. Create such a burden that by the time the day of rest comes, you're exhausted anyway. But it's not just Israel. Are we any different? You know, we do the exact same thing. We take the rest of creation, that picture of stopping work and actually resting in the trust of God, and we turned it into vacation. The rest of creation became our weekly vacation or annual vacation. You ever go on a vacation and you discover that the vacation itself is more work than play? All you need to do is go on a vacation with children and you understand this principle. You get back and you need a vacation from your vacation because it's exhausting. And besides the fact, when you do get home from your vacation, the work is right there waiting for you. Here it is. Back to work. Nose to the grindstone. Listen, God's rest is greater than a vacation. He tried to give the picture in the rest of creation and then gives another picture in the rest of of Canaan. Look at verse 6. The rest of Canaan. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of, again, disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying, note this, through David. So this is how we know David wrote Psalm 95. Saying, through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Psalm 95, verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. The rest of Canaan. Interesting. Exodus chapter 3, verse 17. God said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, the Megabite, (laughs) the flashlight, the termite, the troglodyte, to a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to bring you out of affliction into the land of Canaan, into the rest of Canaan. And it took them 40 years of laborious wandering in the wilderness, trying to learn how to trust in God. And when they finally arrived in Canaan, when they finally went into the land, they failed to enter the rest. How like us all. The pastor reminds us there in verse 8 that Joshua told them to go get it. If Joshua had given them rest, 
He would not have spoken of another day after that rest. Well, Joshua 22 verse 4 tells us, Now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he spoke to them. Therefore, turn now, go to your tents, to the land of your possession. Go to your rest. Go to the land. But again, note the language in verse 8. If Joshua had given them rest, if the rest had taken hold, he would not have spoken of another day after that. In other words, if they had gotten rest in Canaan with Joshua, then 500 years later, David would not still have been writing that they had not yet entered the rest from Psalm 95. He he wouldn't have been revisiting the issue because they would already have been at rest. And so just as the rest of creation was diminished to vacation, so the rest of Canaan was misunderstood simply as a change of location. What do you mean? Man, if we could just get to the promised land, there we'll find rest. If we could just cross over... If we could just be delivered. If we Because here is hard. Here is difficult. Man, if I could just get away from this mess, over there I can get my rest. Ever think like that? If I could just, just change this job, if I could just leave this marriage, if I could move to a different home, if I could go to a different town, if I could attend a different church, then I will get rest. And it is a lie. And the rest that was theirs, had they trusted the Lord in Canaan, turned into a failed rest because it was all about location. Just Let's just get there. You know what happened? They got there and stress came along for the ride. Same with you, same with me. I'm going to uproot and go over there because the grass is definitely greener over there, but when I get there, stress has just come with me. I have seen this over and over, and I don't say this of any of you here tonight, but I have seen people leave churches grumpily, angrily, with frustration. It's the church's fault, so they leave. Guess what? They have the same problem at the next church. Why? Because they brought it with them. And I've told you before, don't ever go somewhere thinking it's the perfect church because you will mess it up. (laughs) Location. Man, I could just change things. Jewish people came into the land of Israel. They saw that as the location of their rest. How restful is the land today? They are beset on all sides. Jews all over the world, and rightly so, are being drawn to the land. Now that's a work of the Spirit. God is working His work because He's going to bring His perfect rest. He's going to bring the ultimate Shabbat. And it's going to be an eternal rest. It'll be fantastic. But they're going back, and the mentality is, man, we got to go there to be safe. And you know, from a physical, natural human perspective, that's a dangerous thought. Well, let's gather all the Jews in one place in the world. Hitler would have loved the idea. Because if they're all in one place, then we can just wipe them out right there. Satan, right now, I guarantee you, Satan loves the idea. He's thinking, we'll just wipe them all out in the same place. God's got a much bigger, restful, fantastic plan. But the land is not restful right now. Parts of it are. I I, I hesitate here just because I'm amazed at how at rest I am when I'm in the land. To be in Israel, there there are these moments where you're just like, I don't want to go anywhere else. Where the location does seem to be quite restful. There are other places in Israel that are a little freaky and a little intense like the Temple Mount, but that's another conversation. The rest of creation, they didn't get it. The rest of Canaan, it still didn't sink in. God's rest is greater than a vacation. It is greater than a location. We're talking about the rest of Christ. Verse 9. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And he's talking about Israel. Because they have not entered it as a people yet. Don't get me wrong. Many Jews have. Many Jewish people have given their lives to Jesus, have found their rest in Jesus, and they are in the church. They're just part of the church. Still Jewish, but part of the church. But Israel as a whole has not entered the rest, not as a people, not yet. 
Verse 10. For the one who has entered his rest, that is God's rest, has himself also, watch this, rested from his works as God did from his. How do you know if you really trust God? You are at rest with him. Well, I'm not saying Christians don't stress out. We all do. But you know, you know when you have faith in Christ, because on the most stressful of days, all you got to do is hear the name of Jesus and the stress starts to go down immediately. All you have to do is stop and pray. And it's remarkable how the peace comes, how the comfort of the Lord fills the heart. And and I encourage you, brothers and sisters, that that's got to be our go to life is going to be hard. Life is going to stress us out. We're going to have sparks flying. The moment it happens, stop and pray. And you will find the rest of the Lord, the rest of Christ. The rest of creation was a picture. The rest of Canaan, again, an idea. But as the old radio commentator Paul Harvey used to famously say, now you know the rest of the story. Because the rest of the story is Jesus. He is not a vacation from your life. He is your life. He's the Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew 12, 8. He's not limited to one location. You don't have to go there to get to Him. He is with you here and now, Matthew 28, verse 20. And in Matthew 11, He's the one who said, verse 28, Come to Me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And note this, that invitation is to the non-believer. Why do you say that? Because the believer doesn't have to come to Jesus. He's already here. i got to come to Him in my mind. i got to come to Him in my spirit. I need to stop the craziness of my life and be aware of Him. So in that way, yeah, I I, I come to him. I hear that invitation. But it's not like the non-believer who has to come to a point of trust to find the rest. Jesus is already with me. He is the rest of my story. He is the rest of my salvation. So verse 11, he says, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest. So that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Be diligent. Uh, Sounds like labor. Work hard to enter that rest. No. What was the example of their disobedience? Was it a lack of work? No. They didn't trust Him. Pure and simple. They just didn't trust God. They whined in the wilderness... They wanted quail. They wanted meat. God said, I'll give you meat till it's coming out of your nostrils. He did, literally. They wanted water. I'll give you water. They wanted, they wanted, they wanted. They whined in the wilderness. They they perspired in the promised land. This is one of the most fascinating things to me, that, that God offered Israel an every seventh year off. Can you imagine if we had that policy at the bridge? Every seven years, Rachel, you get an entire year off. We'll see you later. (laughs) Don't plan on it. Every seventh year, don't work. Just take the year. Let the land rest. Let the land lie fallow. Don't plant. God says, you know what I'm going to do for you? Just trust me. Because I love doing stuff that when you trust me, I I get to show you. So what I'm going to do for you is in the sixth year, I'm going to give you twice your yield. I'm going to give you so much, it's going to cover anything that you would harvest in the seventh year. And then in the first year of the new cycle, I'm going to do the same thing. So you're not going to lack for anything. Just every seventh year, take the year. The Sabbath rest, the land Sabbath. You know what they did? They never kept it once. For 490 years... Every seventh year, they worked the land because they did not trust that God would just take care of them like He said that He would. So they perspired in the promised land. They didn't receive the rest of Canaan that God offered to them. They worked for it because they thought they had to work for it because they did not trust the Lord. 490 years. Seven goes into 490 70 times. 
So God said, I'll tell you what, because you wouldn't obey me, you're going to go rest in Babylon for 70 years, and I'll let my land get the rest that it's been missing for these 490. And they went into captivity. And that's what we do. We work and work and work ourselves captive to the work. And God says, I've invited you to enter my rest. How does that work? Listen, faith is simply trusting God. Trusting God produces obedience. Obedience, for its part, develops faith, which is trusting in God, which develops obedience, which increases faith, which is trusting in God, which develops more obedience, which increases faith. You see what I'm talking about? It is such a simple pattern. And if you say, man, if only I could develop more faith, you can be more obedient. Obedience is the key to faith. The more obedient I am, the more I trust him, because as I obey, I see he, he, he does follow through. He does exactly what he promised he would do. When he says things like Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and all his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you as well. How many of us really believe that? Well, I would seek his kingdom, but I got a 40 hour a week job I got to work. I would seek his kingdom, but I got so much else I've got to do. I got to put food on the table. I got to take care of things. I got my investments. I got my, you know, and, and off we go. We go right off of the pattern. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And he will take care of the rest. Some people do that crazy thing. Jesus did. You know, Paul did. We see different followers of Jesus down through the years who said, you know what? I'm going to test him. I'm just going to try this out. See if it works. I'm going to trust him by obeying. Obedience increases faith, which increases trust, which increases obedience. And there's one more thing that I, that I would add into that circle, one more element that I would put there, that as faith is trusting in God, which produces obedience, which develops more faith, guess what happens? I find rest. Rest. Isaiah 30, verse 15, had to quote it. Thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word. Just to rest upon His promise. Just to know, thus saith the Lord. Lord Jesus, how we trust you. And we here tonight can say, we have proven you over and over and over. We have seen your work. We have seen your faithfulness. We know, Lord. We know through the stories throughout your scriptures. And we know through the stories of our lives that truly, Father, the rest of our story is Jesus. And I pray that among us, Lord, I ask for two things tonight, if I may. One, that you would bring rest to every heart present here. For any brothers or sisters who are stressed out, worked up, and exhausted after long hours of labor... Lord, that we might enter in tonight to a deeper rest, perhaps, than we've had in days or weeks. Oh, Lord, bring the rest of Jesus. And, Father, the only other thing I ask is that you would increase for us opportunities to obey. Make us, Lord, more obedient to you and thus increase our faith. Lord, thank you for your word to us tonight. And thank you for the blessing of the rest that you have promised. May we, as the pastor called us, may we be diligent to enter your rest. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together. Wes, I'm going to have you pray in just a moment.